Hey, how's it going everybody? Thanks for joining my uh, video today. And today I'm going to be talking about um, dichotomies, uh, false dichotomies, and true dichotomies. And what those mean, I'm going to try to, like, if you don't know the style of my video, it's just I kind of go for it and free flow thought off the top of the head. Um, looking at things through a Christian lens and seeing things through that worldview, right? So uh, now I'm n now when I'm talking about uh, the dichotomy, um, I, I'm kind of looking at how people who want to criticize Christians as being maybe like narrow-minded or dogmatic are also oftentimes, and I, w I would actually say all of the time, because I, I don't think any human being has a fully comprehensive understanding of everything all the time. We're limited in our faculties. Um, and so oftentimes though, Christians are specifically targeted um, as being narrow-minded or dogmatic or seeing things too black and white um, and not, not being able to grasp the, the big picture. And I already talked about the big picture and what that is in a different video. So go watch that one if you get the chance. Um, yeah, so I actually haven't done a video for YouTube in a while. Uh, this is my first time filming one in a while, so I might just have to shake the rust off and, and kind of think through these things. But uh, yeah, I mean, Christians probably already know, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe like if you've talked to people about Jesus about sin, about redemption, about light, dark. Um, Jesus was the light that came into the world. Well, well, the, what was the light shining in? Well, it was a dark world. It was a dark backdrop. And in the Gospel of John, it says the light came into the world, but the world did not understand the light. They, they, they didn't want the light because they loved their own sin. They loved their darkness, right? And that's still the case today in the modern era. Um, people who who want to keep living the lives they want to live. I was the same way. Um, oftentimes reject the message of Jesus, the gospel, because they know uh, that it's going it's going to require um, a sacrifice. Well, Jesus paid the sacrifice, but it does require our giving our lives to him to, to live the life for him. Um, even Paul says our bodies are to be living sacrifices to the Lord. And, um, and that's the way, like by, by dying to ourselves, Jesus said, whoever loves their own life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so there's a weird paradox there where that dichotomy of freedom and slavery, um, which is a very real dichotomy, kind of gets inverted to where when we are in our sins, we think that to sin is freedom, to sin is autonomy. Um, but what actually ends up happening is we, we become enslaved to that system, to the system of sin, and then to the pattern of the world. And we ultimately, uh, what it says, I believe it's in um, Proverbs, it might be Psalms, but what it said, what it says is that people who do not know the Lord, who, um, are living for the pleasures of this life, uh, for temporary things, for things that are not eternal or of the kingdom of God, they're like, uh, they're like beautiful flowers in a field, but they will pass away. And, Actually, I think that's talking about the wicked specifically. So people who do wickedness. Um, but I think that that does correspond to not knowing the Lord who is the source of goodness, of righteousness, of uh, truth. Jesus was the embodiment of truth, right? And so he came to set us free from our sin by becoming sin for us. And being hung on a cross, becoming the curse and being hung on the cross. And that was, of course, prophesied many times in the Old Testament 
um, even all the way back to the beginning with the tree of death. Um, and then also in, uh, I, I, I believe it's in Numbers, where Moses lifts up the bronze snake in the desert, uh, where, where the Israelites were being attacked by snakes and bitten. Um, and they, they were killed. <clears throat> um, and I think they were dying in, in uh, droves and, and massive numbers. Uh, and God made Moses uh, create this pagan looking symbol, which was a, a snake on a pole, which where you, when you look at the medical symbol with the snake on the, on the cross, that's what that's coming from. So uh, that was pointing forward to what the son of God himself would, would come to do for humanity, that all who looked upon the cross would be healed, just as all who looked upon the bronze serpent and the pole and believed in the power of God would be healed from their snake bite. Well, where did the snake, what did the serpent in the garden do? It, it led us to the fall, to the curse. So I, I don't propose to know the way that all of these symbols and all of these actual events, but they're also very figurative and, and symbolic. I don't really know exactly how they all correspond perfectly, but it's a beautiful, they're beautiful mysteries that, that show that God was weaving together a story that he was a part of um, throughout, throughout the history of humanity, uh, and, and specifically through the Israelite people, um, but ultimately to bring all nations to himself. Um, so that all nations would look on the cross and, and be healed of their sin. That's what Christ came. And at the time that Christ came, the people thought that he was going to deliver them from the Romans, from oppression. Um, what they didn't realize was that he was there to deliver them from a more primary and deeper oppression, which was the oppression of human sinfulness. Um, which uh, they, I, think, I think it was hard for them to grasp that because their day-to-day -day reality was living under... Uh, Roman tyranny um, but but God recognized that the deeper reality the unseen reality was the mechanisms of the human heart that were um, propelling and initiating humanity forward into this this darkness that was um, that we are unable to overcome where we're literally not able to overcome uh, our sin and that's why every person experiences this to some degree. Atheists, um, Christians, it doesn't matter who you are. We all recognize a lack in our own capacity. Our own, we, we don't even live up to our own standards. How, how do we expect ourselves to live up to God's? Anyways, so, so there's that dichotomy of freedom versus slavery that Christ turned on his head. He said, he lived, I think, I think a lot of people, especially Christians, would argue that he was the most free human being who ever lived. He lived in true freedom, um, and everybody looks at him, and, and, and they recognize him, excuse me, as being the source of that true freedom. And so that's a big reason why they put their trust in him, because they re recognize, like, hey, I'm a slave to sin. Um, I can't do anything about my sin on my own. Christ died for my sin. Let me put my trust and faith in him. And then he can set me free from that sin. And that was um, what he came to do. Uh, and so we put, we put our trust in him and then he sets us free, right? Uh, come follow me and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, right? Free from what? Free from the Romans free from the Republicans, free from the Democrats. No, free from our own sin. Uh, so, <clears throat> so Christ lived the truly free life, but he understood the dichotomy of good versus evil, right? He understood that he did nothing on his own of his own selfish ambition because he was, he was man, but he was also God. So he, he was, in human flesh and he experienced temptation in every way the book of hebrews says but he um submitted to his father every day of his life 
when he went to wake up Lazarus from death, Lazarus died. His disciples were like, why are you going back into Judea? They just tried to kill you, remember? And he said, there are 12 hours in a day. He who walks in the day does not stumble, but he who walks in the night stumbles, right? I'm paraphrasing. But what he recognized, he, was, he wasn't talking about the sun and then the nighttime skies. Um, he was talking about spiritual light. And that, that light came from his father. He said, I do nothing but what the father wants me to do. Now, in our modern age, we might think of that as like lacking autonomy. Jesus only did what his father wanted him to do. So his father was controlling him. No, Jesus had free will. But he also, his steps were determined by God. His steps were determined by the father. They, they were, and that was why he was the most free, because God is the designer of our free will. God designs um, God designs our hearts to, to know him, to be in relationship with him. And the more submitted we are to him, which to our world sounds like slavery, but the more submitted we are to him, the more free we are. And I can personally attest to that because when I, before I knew Christ and I was in my sins, I thought that it was super fun to go and get drunk, to get high, to do whatever, right? And um, that was all my heart wanted. And uh, and then when I when I came to when the Holy excuse me when the Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin and who I really was on the inside, um, I recognized that it was my understanding that was darkened. I had been deceived, and I needed to submit my life to Jesus in order to be set free from my sin. And now, and but I thought that at that time, I thought that uh, that would be trading kind of a freer life, that a life that I had built up for myself by my own power, by my own strength, by my own ambition, and trading that for this like dull monastic life uh, of like living in a in a church for the rest of my life and and doing nothing but singing hymns, right? And and playing harps, or whatever the caricature is. That's what I thought I was trading. And now looking back, I realize that my old life was what was gray and dim and dark. And my new life is what is uh, jumping out and vibrant with living color. Um, because Christ has set me free, he has, he has made my mind uh, want to focus on the things of God. The things that are eternal and not the things that are temporary. Um, and and where, where I was just scratching in the dirt, right? And so... Um, I thought back then that Christians were super simplistic. They were seeing everything through a false series of dichotomies. And what I realize now is that, yeah, Christians do see the world in a black and white way, but so do other people. Uh, other people see the dichotomy. The di uh, that, that dichotomy holds true. And I would say that the more simplistic dichotomy comes from uh, the alternative view um and and i i would say like i i talk about marxism in a lot of my videos but it's a good example or maybe postmodernism um postmodernism kind of sees everything as like not really lacking any ho or not really having any substantive cohesion whether you're talking about truth or definition that both of those things are kind of uh they're malleable um uh, and they're just shifting as humanity evolves, they're, they're like shifting sand, right? And Christ even said, he who builds his life on my word will build it on a strong foundation, but he who builds his life on the shifting sand um, does not have a strong foundation. And so any, excuse me, any wind of the time can just blow it over. So postmodernism being that bed of shifting sand of ideas or uh, cultures or laws or attitudes or whatever it is, it is the bed of shifting sand. It's the closest thing we can come to intellectually as thinking of like a literal bed of shifting sand that Christ was warning us of not being there. So am I going to base my my uh, interpretation of truth on uh, Michael Foucault or some other uh, philosopher or some other postmodern scholar, scholar or Karl Marx who viewed everything through an oppressor pr oppressed dichotomy? A very simplistic dichotomy of people uh, narrowing and, and reducing people down to their 
various identity groups, their economic classes? Or am I going to focus my, my uh, attention and my trust on the words of God himself, the Son of God who rose from the grave, who proved the power of God and who he was? Well, I'm going to put my trust there because he actually holds the keys to everything, the, the deepest human mystery, which is death. He overcame death. He has authority over death itself. And so, by putting our trust in him, we hope to uh, participate in his resurrection as well. Um, but we have to die to our sin. We have to die to ourselves, to our own wants and desires. And then, it's like this weird paradox, right? Where we give those things to Christ, and he gives us what we what we truly desire, the desires of our spirit, which is unity with him, which is his love. Um, so those are the false and true dichotomies, right? That, that, uh, that the world operates on. And, um, I think this is a problem, but I, but I want to say that, uh, I think that this problem might be the same in every generation, or it could be intensifying as the generations go along, um, depending on the culture and nation that we're in. Uh, and that is the, the notion of like the Bible and the things of God becoming more and more taboo in the culture. You know, like people in this day and age are raised on these other like secularized and naturalistic um, notions from grade school onward. I know I was. I was raised in school to believe that, like, everything came about just totally by chance, uh, totally naturalistic. Um, I was raised on Disney movies and, and all that stuff, and I was never taught the Bible. But these first century Jews, right, they, they were raised on Scripture. They understood Scripture. Um, and, and so, like, in our day and age kids aren't being brought up with this worldview so like and lots of times they're being brought up with the notion of like god as being a tyrant god as being a cosmic um force that is out to get them right um and that's not true like yes god has wrath god has uh he's a just judge and he will deliver people over to their destruction when they are acting wickedly right um, that's just justice. That's And God's notion of justice is higher than our own notion of justice, right? But people are brought up today as thinking like God is out to get them. He's evil. You know, we have we have these, uh, these movies that are teaching people that like God is basically the superhero villain. He's the Thanos. He's the Ultron. He's Ronin, right? Like he's all these things. Um, and if you're a kid and you're growing up on that, what's going to happen when you're introduced to the idea of like a sovereign God who created everything, who wants to bring people into unity with himself? You're going to think that like he's wanting to control you. He's wanting. And, and that that goes all the way back to to Marx saying religion is the opiate of the masses. Marx saw like the world of has the world as being heartless and he saw religion as its heartless heart. Right. Um, and so he was able to influence people with an actual opiate of the masses and to sedate people with his philosophy by sh by making people think that Christians um, and and Jews, he hated Jews, um, were like under the influence of uh, their minds were darkened by religion. But he like, of course, he he created a religion, too. So everybody has a religion. It doesn't matter whether you're. Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, or atheist, you are operating on a series of frameworks by which you see the world, by which you go and make your decisions every day. Everybody has a worldview um, and an understanding and a religion. Um, and the Bible doesn't even talk about religion that much. Um, the one th place that I can think of the word religion where it's actually used is in the book of James, where it says religion that is pure and faultless is this, 
Look after the orphan and widow and keep yourself from being polluted by the world. Like that was as simple as it got for them. Um, but Jesus didn't come to, to like promote Christianity. Christianity wasn't even a thing. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus came, like the word Christian actually, I believe it was a derogatory term uh, used by people who saw the Christians as uh, you know, as stupid or whatever during the first century. Um, and, but Jesus came to show his authority on earth. He, he came to preach the kingdom of God that, that among all these failing systems of man, there was going to be a, a system that God had implanted in the world that was actually going to grow and to, and to be the true system of rule in the earth and he came to show that he was the seed for the kingdom of god to to plant it in the earth and to watch it grow the mustard seed growing into a large tree where the, a, a beautiful tree where birds could come and and nest in its branches and he came to preach the kingdom of god he came to show that he had authority on earth to forgive sins he came to die for our sins. He came to rise from the grave and to show that eternal life was the real um, destination. The eternal life, the kingdom of God, was the real destination for humanity. Um, not that we just get to float around in a disembodied spirit state. Not that we die and we just go into the dirt and then we decompose. None of those things. So anyways, um, wanted to keep this video at about 20 minutes. So uh, hope you enjoyed. Let me know what you think in the comments. God bless.